It's a delight to see so many of you as, uh, joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for coming out for the panel from different parts of the world, uh, from Sri Lanka, from Kenya, from California, and of course, uh, from Toronto, Canada. My name is uh, Shubhra Gururani. I'm the director of, uh, of York Center for Asian Research, YCAR. I'm also a faculty member in the Department of Anthropology. I'm really pleased to host our second event in the series, Demos, Democratization and Democracy in South Asia, which we launched recently in October, 2022, and I held our first event uh, on media and democracy in India. Uh, today's event is a second in the series and we are co-organizing, which we're co-organizing co with Jim Hoor. I will talk briefly about it. Uh, and the third one uh, will, will, be, will be held in fall 2023 with a focus on Pakistan. So please stay tuned for that to come forward. Uh, today's panel, uh, as it, almost to the date, as you'll recall, uh, around March 30th, 31st, uh, early April, the headlines of all national dailies around the world were filled with images of protesters staging mass peaceful protests in front of the presidential house in Sri Lanka and eventually moving into the president's palace. These protests came as a surprise to those of us who were watching them from a distance. The world had not seen anything like this and the headlines cried that Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka's old political order has collapsed to the country in peril and so on. And as one observer noted, amid unprecedented inflation, lengthy blackouts, acute uh, food and fuel shortages, the crisis was simmering for a while and they just reached a boiling point and sparked a months long wave of peaceful protests, public protests across the nation. The cabinet uh, capitulated quickly, resigning en masse on April 3rd, 2022. And the continuous anti-government street protests despite enforced curfews compelled the president to flee the country on July 13, 2022. The people's peacefully expressed frustration, desperation and anger clearly had an impact. Since then, Things seem to have improved, so-called, but the situation on the ground is far from normal. Today, in order to understand how the context, how the, the crisis emerged, what is the context, how did it happen, what have been the fallout of these ongoing crises for different, different uh, groups, social, uh, social groups, and in different fronts, and importantly, what comes next? And what as scholars and students of South Asia, of uh, political uh, and economic, uh, contentions and turmoil can learn from what is going on in Sri Lanka today. It is my real pleasure to introduce a distinguished panel of experts who are joining us from, from different parts of the world. And I'm honored and grateful to, for them to coming out at early morning and late at night and share the reflections with us today. I will introduce each one of them be shortly before they uh, present, but I would like to also quickly take this opportunity to thank uh, many of those who have made this event possible. Uh, faculties of liberal arts and professional studies, arts and media performance and design, a faculty of environmental and urban change, departments of anthropology, politics, social science, sociology, and most importantly, the office of the vice president's research and innovation. It is also my pleasure to thank the hard work of coordinating and promoting the event and working with Jamhur. I would like to thank Alicia Filipovic, our center coordinator, Alex Felipe, our media coordinator, and members of uh, Jamhur, Hadia Akhtar, and Arsalan Samdani. I also would like to acknowledge the land in which we, the host, York University and Waikar are located. So let me just read out the land acknowledgement. York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The treaty is subject of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great, Great Lakes regions. Moving forward, I would now like to welcome Professor Jennifer Heinemann, the Associate Vice President of Research, to say a few words about York and Waikar. Professor Heinemann is a, is, 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 a, um, is, the vice, is a political geographer who previously served as a director for the Center for Refugee Studies. 
Her extensive research and writings focus on conflict zones and traces how the dynamics of conflict and disaster, which, which she calls the dual disasters, create refugee migrants, as well as responses to these crises in thinking about international human, humanitarian responses. She has conducted research in Sri Lanka, Horn, Horn of Africa, and Canada. So well, to you, uh, uh, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Shubra. Welcome to everyone on this call, and especially a warm welcome to our speakers today. I'm honored to be here and to, to welcome you to York, um, uh, you know, remotely, as it were. Um, and I and I am just delighted that this uh, that YCAR has been able to uh, convene this event. It's so timely. It is so important. Um, I've been a member of YCAR for many years now, and I I especially appreciate the the breadth of of research that can be done. Uh, you know, Asian studies is uh, or, or at least Asian research is both the diaspora and um, you know, regional uh, geographies, but, but you know, basically the politics and geopolitics that uh, create uh, economic disaster as much as other kinds of humanitarian disasters, as Shubra mentioned. Th this, uh, it is a personal topic for me since I have worked in Sri Lanka for a couple of decades with collaborators. This was a picture actually from uh, uh, Save the Children tsunami response way back um, after the tsunami, but uh, to Shubra's point, um, the politics of peace and the politics of uh, disaster uh, um, have overlapped uh, for a very long time in Sri Lanka. And so it is a, it's a topic very personal and close to my own um, research interests and my own politics, I would say. But let me welcome you to York on behalf of the Vice President Research, Amr Asif, who is not able to be here today. Um, as Associate VP for Research, I have the privilege of, of welcoming you in a kind of formal way, but I, I would like to say that York um, in many ways represents Sri Lanka well. It is, it is the world in a university in one sense of all the universities I've, I've had the privilege of visiting in my life. Um, it represents more diasporas for more war zones, um, and, and of course Sri Lanka is one of those. Um, than any other place I've been. It's a, it's a real privilege to teach and, and do research here. Um, I did have the privilege also of being invited to a Center for Poverty Analysis um, meeting in 2014, some time ago now. Um, and I was asked to speak on some of the, the kind of political economy aspects, the, the concerns that were rising then around fear of overload of debt. Um, the IMF was saying, it's oh, it's okay to borrow more money. Um, and, and being in this context where securitization and where you know, uh, um, a very um, a very strong uh, presence by the government of the day in these spaces of of uh, of uh, scholarly um, and critical discussion were present. Um, I remember meeting people at that at that very meeting who who couldn't really explain to me why they were there. Um, so, so all to say, things have have blown up um, in ways, and not blown up, but. Uh, all of you will speak to the situation in Sri Lanka, which I'm very much looking forward to. I am, of course, uh, outraged and and feel a great amount of despair at, at what has happened. So I uh, I want to say, as my last point here, simply I know a vote of thanks always comes at the end of a of a um, presentation such as those we will hear today, but I would like to make a preemptive. A vote of thanks on behalf of our office and our university for you being here. I so appreciate it and um, I very much look forward to the talks. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for your continued support. I really appreciates it. I would now, as I mentioned, that this event, our second event, is co organized with Jamhur, and I would like to invite uh, Devyani, Devyani uh, to say a few words about uh, Jamhur and the work they're doing. Devyani? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Devyani. I'm a PhD candidate with the Department of History at U of T um, and a lead editor with the Jumhur Collective. So just to quickly tell you a little bit about our organization. Um, launched in 2018, Jumhur is a critical left media organization that amplifies marginalized and progressive voices from South Asia through contributions from students, academics, activists, and organizers. We promote insights that situate the region and its diasporas within capitalism, imperialism, patriarchy, 
casteism, racism, and other structures of power. Shaped largely by the corporate media, public discourse continues to sketch South Asia and South Asians in monochrome. This services everything from imperialist adventures by the US, white supremacist mobilizations across U Europe and North America, and anti-minority programs in the subcontinent. With the global ascendance of neo-fascist regimes, the discursive material targeting of South Asians has assumed an acute pitch. We want to contest and reverse these representations by generating a dynamic portrait of South Asia, one that is colored by the issues that are most pressing to its jamhur, an Urdu word for the people. Most recently, this was demonstrated in our issue on imperialism in South Asia. Um, so do feel free to check that out. Uh, we're also a member of the Progressive International, and Jamhur is very happy to be collaborating with Vicar for this great panel discussion. And we hope to continue such collaborations in the future concerning South Asia and its populations. Thank you. Thank you, Devyani. Likewise, we are very happy to be uh, collaborating with you and look forward to future collaborations and organizing um, this events going forward. All right, so off to our uh, panel. Uh, the, the order of presentation is we're going to start with uh, Professor Jaydeva Aungada, those of you who work in Sri Lanka and South Asia. Professor Aungada is, uh, does not need any introduction. Uh, he is a, he's a professor emeritus in political science and public policy uh, in the University of Col uh, Colombo. And from August uh, 2016 and, uh, until 2017, he held the prestigious Rajni Kothari Chair of Democracy at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies uh, in New Delhi, India. Professor Ungada has published extensively on Sri Lanka's ethnic conflict, minority rights, conflict and peace processes, democratization, and state reform in Sri Lanka. He has a long list of publications, which I cannot go, go over right now, but the one of his recent publications is called Political Science, a Contemporary Introduction, Political Parties in Sri Lanka, Change and Continuity, which he co-edited in 2017, and another one called Local Government and Local Democracy in Sri Lanka, Institutional and Social Dimensions, also co-edited in 2015. He has been a member of Council of Management of Social Scientists Association, a leading non-state academic institution in Sri Lanka, engage in research, knowledge, production, and public, public publishing in the social sciences. He is currently editing a book titled, entitled Democracy and Democratization in Sri Lanka, Paths, Trend, and Imaginations. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ungada, for uh, coming out for our panel today. Really appreciate it and grateful to you for your uh, input and insights. Uh, we have, a just, just to get you started, we have a few, few questions for you, and I'll put them in front of you right now, and you can take them the way you would like to answer them. So we would, what we would like, we'll appreciate if you could please give us an overview uh, of the political and economic crisis that led to the protests last year. And some of and if you could also highlight some of the shifts in economic and political arrangements that have happened since then. So uh, thank you and over to you, Professor. Thank you very much for uh, that kind of introduction. And I also want to begin by thanking uh, Shubha Gurwani for in, and her colleagues for inviting me and also for organizing this event. So I'll try to be as brief and as simple possible because I have only 10 minutes to respond to a question that requires a, a longer uh, discussion. Uh, Sri Lanka's economy has been, um, you know, for several years like a volcano waiting to erupt. Uh, so what happened in the 2022 is a kind of a eruption that a lot of people probably knew that it was going to erupt, but not in 2022 in that particular manner. But I think the COVID pandemic and the pandemic induced economic and social crisis, and also the political crisis that was uh, generated by the, the combined impact of the economic and social crisis underlying the economic crisis. Now, in Sri Lanka, people don't talk about the social crisis and political crisis. They are mostly forgotten. But last year, in 2022, during the citizens' uprising, all these three were highlighted. There's a deep-seated economic crisis that has structural as well as, you know, short-term uh, roads and courses. I think the long-term structural 
dimension of Sri Lanka's economic crisis is linked to the nature of the Sri Lankan economy. Actually, for the past uh, 45 years, Sri Lanka has gone through a very protracted process of economic liberalization, starting with in 1978, economic liberalization, then structural adjustment programs in the 1980s, followed by globalization and finally neoliberal reforms. So uh, that in a way created a certain fundamental you know, structural distortions to Sri Lankan economy. Sri Lankan economy became very much a part of the global economy, uh, linked to very closely linked to the world market. And also the, uh, the, the nature of the economy has been such that it became a totally import dependent, you know, manufacturing, manufacture based economy. And with a kind of a capitalist class that is not very interested in long term, you know, development in terms of capitalist development or industrial development. And also, we also had the Sri Lanka a capitalist class that is very much regime dependent. Uh, so that's why a lot of people uh, made the argument that, you know, this political corruption and the, this nexus between the political class and the business class has been one of the fundamental structural reasons for the economic crisis. But there was also, uh, you know, the war, you know, the 25 years of, you know, protracted civil war has also been one factor that has contributed to the kind of, you know, uh, the stagnation of the economy. Uh, the, the Sri Lankan economy, a um, lot of people expected after 2009, when the war came to an end, would enter into a new process of at least takeoff, but it didn't happen. What happened in another, you know, phase of, you know, distorted economic development with uh, close economic links with, uh, uh, with China and also with, uh, you know, continually dependent on what we call, uh, uh, you know, the, the, private, uh, you know, credit uh, from the, the private sources and banks and individuals as well uh, to address the, the challenge of balance of payment crisis, as well as uh, the dollar crisis, foreign exchange crisis. So what happened in 2020, 2021 are quite interesting economically and politically. There was a regime change in 2019 uh, with a new president being elected. Uh, who promised to, you know, make Sri Lanka a gender development state in the model of, you know, combination of China, Singapore, and Malaysia. So then, uh, you know, the whole, uh, it was a kind of a culmination of a long process of de-democratization in Sri Lanka, because Sri Lanka politically, uh, our political structure is constitutionally uh, kind of, a, you know, very, uh, uh, highly executive presidential centric authoritarianism in which parliamentary democracy is subservient to the 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 all powerful executive branch of the state but we have a nominal parliamentary process democracy but what is extremely interesting is that when uh, the covid crisis set in and it created uh, you know unprecedented social crisis because uh, uh, in 2020, uh, when the first phase of the Sri Lankan COVID crisis resulted in rapid loss of employment and loss of businesses and you know the decline of tourist income and also this whole erosion of Sri Lanka's you know base the the the, the, the foundations of uh, you know foreign reserves. So as a result. Uh, you know, uh, there was a massive, unprecedented foreign exchange crisis. And that's also the foreign exchange crisis is linked to uh, the structural nature of the Sri Lankan economy uh, that I mentioned earlier. So then, uh, you know, there were kind of a two waves of, uh, you know, what I call uh, pauperization in Sri Lanka after 2020 amidst uh, the economic crisis induced by the COVID pandemic. Uh, initially, a uh, lot of people, you know, working people, uh, particularly the working class, and small businesses lost their, you know, 
sources of income that was a rapid spread of poverty among the poor so the poor people became poorer in that period and the, the second phase of the crisis uh, you know was the you know the middle class people becoming poorer so then we have two middle class becoming poor so there were the two waves of you know successive waves of you know empower spreading poverty and uh, you know pauperization in this country so the then the political crisis uh, was in a way the crisis of the executive presidential system in sri lanka so you can you know interpret the economic crisis as also a crisis of the neoliberal economic development model as the political crisis as the crisis of this executive authoritarian presidential authoritarian political model of sri lanka so what is unique in what happened in 2022 in the form of citizen protest is the for the first time in the sri lankan history people citizens uh, you know began to demand uh, you know fundamental reforms in the political order uh, because there have been a series of uh, protests in sri lanka in 1920 21 and 22 was a culmination of those protests but no one could have predicted that such a mass you know uh, action by the people without prior you know mobilization by a political party or any civil society organization so almost spontaneous so that is what was unique in that so the political crisis at the moment it has been under some control in the sense that it the citizens movement is no longer active in the sense it was in the 2022 but the government the new you know the, there's a successor president in july who was appointed by parliament in sri lanka he managed to put together what i call a tripartite coalition in order to you know uh, restore the 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 the, 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 the uh, restore the what you call political order so these three groups you know three parties of this new ruling coalition are the united united national party and sri lanka podu jana peramuna podu jana peramuna is the rajapaksha dominated party and the united national party is the political party of the uh, former opposition uh, party but is now part of the ruling party but more importantly other than these two civilian political parties there is a military police establishment as one of the most active component of this new ruling coalition that indicates the where sri lankan you know politics is moving in the kind of direction the latest development is that the government has gazetted a new legislation to replace prevention of terrorism leg act it's called a, a anti terrorism law which makes even you know street protests not only just a crime but also act of terrorism so there is a you know the, the way the the new polit ruling coalition is responding to uh, the, the the citizens you know uh, uprising last year is to bring in new legislation that criminalizes and also makes a terrorist crime even the protest against the government so we are in a way uh, sri lanka is moving into a new phase of what i call de democratization that is a heightened process of de democratization that uh, is uh, unfortunately a kind of a response that the ruling class ruling party or other ruling you know political class things is the most you know important response that they can find so sri lanka's democracy is once again in crisis last year there was a you know kind of unprecedented and unique political awakening of the citizens demanding a direct role in the political process you know demanding a you know what they call the system change demanding a entirely new political culture demanding that political class to you know leave power right and leo uh, you know the, the the kind of a letter you know new generation of you know political you know uh, political class to you know emerge but it doesn't seem to be emerging so what we 
find in Sri Lanka at the moment, the old order uh, is consolidating itself using all the resources of the state and also the IMF support. Right, the IMF has been imposing a kind of, uh, or rather, you know, you know that uh, we all know the IMF uh, prescriptions for the economic recovery in a crisis like we have in Sri Lanka. So the new policy prescription is to, you know, place the entire burden of economic recovery victims of the economic crisis. That is the poor, the working people, and the middle classes. That's what we have in Sri Lanka at the moment. So maybe I will stop there uh, because I have now exceeded my 10 minutes. So I'll be very happy to respond to any of the questions that you will have you know, the, during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your comments, Professor Angada. Yes, absolutely. This is a the politics of de-democratization, which you are uh, talking about, is unfortunately not limited to Sri Lanka, but seems to be unfortunately a trend in the subcontinent. So I think there's much to be thinking about uh, on that note. And also, uh, you know, uh, hopefully we'll have some time. But I would like to now invite uh, Professor Thiruni Kalagama. Uh, Professor Kalagama is a lecturer in Modern South Asian Studies at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies and a junior research fellow at Wolfson College, University of Oxford. Uh, her work is at the, lies at the intersection of political geography and development studies, and her research looks at the political and infrastructural transformations triggered by development in Sri Lanka and the Global South more broadly. Uh, for Thiruni, we have a, a question which kind of emanate from Professor Ongada's presentation and something which uh, you yourself have been working on, so could you please uh, say a few words about how the role of, uh, how the legacy of the civil war has played uh, a crucial role in shaping the, um, the economic and political crisis we saw uh, emerge and erupt last year. So over to you, Thirunu, and thanks once again. Thank you very much for this invitation, Shubra, and to be part of the roundtable, and especially for giving me a chance to talk with such a distinguished panel of speakers. Before I start, I'll I will add in case I get kicked out of the Zoom because of my very bad internet, because I'm currently in Kenya, I was at a workshop, I apologize and hopefully it won't be a problem. Um, the question that you ask is very pertinent and hugely important. I mean, Professor Wiangod has more or less kind of give, set the stage up perfectly to start off with, I think, because right now we are almost one year into the economic and political crisis. We all watched unfold last year that Sri Lanka is still living through. But it is also 75 years since Sri Lanka got independence from the British. So last but not least, come June, it will also be one year since Sri Lanka filed for bankruptcy. So you ask me then what role the legacy of the civil war played in shaping the crisis of last year, and a crisis that is still ongoing, really. To answer this again, as Professor Angoda said, this is more or less worthy of a book, but in mere 10 minutes, I would like to kind of touch on one very important factor that I think that needs to, that really needs to be highlighted when you talk about the civil war, the legacy of the civil war, and, how, and what is going on in Sri Lanka right now, and that is the role of development. Um, so addressing the country on February 4th at the Independent Day, Independence Day uh, celebrations in Colombo, Professor um, President Ranil Vikramasinghe uh, asked, and I quote, um, today we are facing an unprecedented economic crisis hitherto never experienced. Why have we to face such a situation? Who is responsible for such? So now, unquote, now this speech was given at an extravagant celebration, which really exacerbated the rising anger of millions undergoing harsh austerity measures. And Vikram Singer, whose seven-month tenure as an unelected and unpopular president has been marked by state violence and repression, and he, he answered his own question. He somewhat acknowledged that this crisis was the result of uh, government policies over several decades, and what he said was, again, let me quote, all of us are more or less responsible for this situation. We made mistakes from the beginning. He finished this speech then with a questionable, and I would like to say a farcical maybe promise by claiming we can become a developed world by developed country by 20, 2048. 
So let me then say why development then? So development is an important, highly contentious word in the history of post-colonial Sri Lanka. Usually this word is taken to refer to economic progress and transformation as general, we generally understand. But in Sri Lanka, development is and has always been an inherently political project that is synonymous or one can be one that is synonymous or a conduit for Sinhala Buddhist nationalism. So my question then maybe, which is also rather an answer to your question is how do we understand this political project? A project that was and has always been a vehicle for nationalism, a project that was one of the biggest causes for the civil war and one of the most important. And maybe you can also say one of the oldest reasons for this ongoing crisis. So going back a little, post-colonial Sri Lanka's biggest risk with development was the Mahavali Development Program, which was the largest engineering project implemented in the country. So this ambitious project is a large-scale irrigation project that diverted water from the Mahavali Ganga to the northern dry zone of the country to provide water for paddy cultivation for settlers who are largely brought in from other areas of the country. So this project covered almost 40% of the country and was planned over 30 years, and it was presented as something that would be the driving force behind the island's economy. More importantly than this high modernist project was the first and also the most sustained effort at development to be infused with um, a deep Sinhala Buddhist nationalist significance. So one hand, what you have is a, the project which facilitated the mobilizing of this glorious Sinhala nation, returning to its glorious past, which was capturing the territory of the Sinhalese civilization to then create what was seen as the more developed future. So, but at the same time, and this is what is most important, is that it was used as an instrument to displace, exclude and attack ethnic and religious minorities. But these grand promises of this project were controversial and it was also the subject of much scrutiny. And it was not, it was very quickly noted that these plans were dangerous to the Tamils as early as 1949. But obviously this criticism was overlooked. And instead this massive development project became the main achievement of J.R. Jayawardena's United National Party when it came to power in 1977. So what that happened then was it was renamed the Accelerated Mahavali Development Program and the project was fast tracked and due for completion in six years with Jayawardena claiming that this project would, and I quote, he would see what he said was it was the biggest development project in Asia. So despite these grand proclamations and these grand promises of development, what really happened in reality was that the World Bank, which had funded this Marvelli project with six loans, revealed that the project had more or less failed to deliver on the creation of an egalitarian society of smallholder rice farmers. It had only exacerbated existing poverty conditions with the income of resettled farmers falling well below the poverty level. And eventually this project was declared a failure. But for the Sinhala Buddhist nation, the Mahavali project was actually a success. And the reason is, while that it brought to, while that it brought no development as planned, it had successfully managed to dramatically reconfigure the ethnic ratio of the northern and eastern districts. So the, though the Mahavali authority, through the Mahavali authority, thousands of Sinhali settlers were moved to uh, loosely populated areas in the northern and eastern dry zone to expand the settlement frontier to become farmers. And in the last of the schemes established under the project in Manalaru or Valioya, as it was renamed in Sinhalese in 1988, Sinhalese farmers were clandestinely resettled with the help of the military. So most of these schemes then of the Mahavili project were established deep in the hinterland of the provinces. Um, which were inhabit inhabited by Tamils and Muslims. And what happened was it made them minorities in their own territories. So this has, it has been largely documented by a large number of scholars and activists and um, a lot of academia that these development projects and the settlement schemes only contributed to the ethnic segmentation of districts and divisions. So as a result, what happened was the ethnic composition of the North and the East dramatically, dra dramatically changed in the ethnic ratios. And these resettled farmers became the frontiersmen of the Northern and Eastern dry zone, but in, and also this ensured that the Sinhalese population and base established Sinhala Buddhist hegemony in the dry zone. So what happened when the war finished? So with the end of the civil war in May, 2009, this temporarily halted development project, which was halted because of the civil war, 
uh, was restarted. And this happened with the Mahavili authority and the military, they started to work together and bring in new waves of Sinhalese from the south of the country, mainly Hambantota, which is the home of the Rajapaksas and neighboring districts. Um, and the, what, what happened was people were given land to settle in and around Valio. Many of these settlers were more or less lured with the promise of paddy land, which never materialized on arrival. And instead, they were given a plot of land to build a house and placed immediately on the electoral register. The military made sure that they do not leave and any absence of more than five days had to be accounted for. And in 2010, the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka also further strengthened the existing extensive and unaccounted power of the Mahavali Authority in the case Environmental Foundation versus Mahavali Authority of Sri Lanka and others by not stopping or reversing the project. So to date, nothing has changed. The Mahavali Authority under successive governments since the end of the civil war continues to issue land to Sinhalese to resettle as farmers in the very areas, thousands of Tamils remain displaced from their lands and homes. So this obsession then, if you call it with development, grew. It was a post-colonial project, it grew after the end of the war, and until, and this was basically what the defining era of, defining thing of the post-war period. So until Sri Lanka defaulted on its loans and declared bankruptcy, it was in the middle of a massive infrastructure boom with new investment directed into development projects such as roads, ports, and airports in its fast-tracked attempt to more or less become a regional and maritime hub. What Development was used, and this whole project of development, it was used to nurture political violence instead of countering it. So in 2009, when Mahindra Rajapaksa and his government, what they did was they promised to bring peace and stability through development and reconstruction and prioritized security and economic growth over ethnic reconciliation. When Gotabe Rajapaksa was elected on in 2019, and this was through a platform of technocratic governance, security, and discipline, he further ignored the country's religious and ethnic minorities. So his election manifesto, Vistas of Prosperity and Splendor, guaranteed the acceleration of economic development. So determined then to make this reality, economic development, a reality at the expense of any other ethnic or political consideration, what the Rajapaksas did was they turned to China as an insignificant source of investment potential. So since 2000, since 2000, successive governments have built a large series of development projects constructed with international financing, such as the Lotus Tower in Colombo, the uh, Hambantota Mahindra Rajapaksa Harbour, the airport, the Matala International Airport, and the Port City Project in Colombo. So the goal, again, as I mentioned before, was to become a regional trading hub in the Indian Ocean. So... This long-standing manic prioritizing of development, which started then with the Mahavili Development Program, as I spoke about, alongside expanding securitization, increasing authoritarianism, and abuse of emergency regulations at the expense of all other ethnic and political considerations, has multiple consequences. And A, the civil war is one. The end of the civil war only ensured that development was used to assert power and consolidate a triumphalist single nationalist project. And one of them, the biggest repercussions is this crisis that we are in today. So today, and I'm just going to, I probably do not need to say this, today millions of Sri Lankans are suffering. Poverty rates have increased to almost 26%. Three in 10 households are food insecure. And what we saw, the protests of last year, which saw the storming of the presidential secretariat and um, the ref residencies, official residencies, which and finally forced the Rajapaksas out of power, have really amounted to no meaningful reform. And Vikramasinghe's very unpopular appointment in the midst of these protests as president, after a 46-year political career, has only caused more anger. And his decision to postpone the local government elections, which were held in March, resulted in a new wave of protests, which was immediately met with more violence, with uh, more than two dozen injured and hospitalized. So then what next? So as I think I've taken up more, more or less my time, I'd like to say then end by saying that the one urgent way then to overcome this crisis that we are presently in, as well as the democratic backsliding and the ongoing descent into fascism, is for then this Sri Lankan state to move away from the use of development as a political project. And how do we do that? that? And that is to fundamentally and radically rethink and work towards a new inclusive development model. And this is a model that needs to be centered on, on growth, 
that is not centered on growth, but more or less centered on equality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiruni, for those excellent uh, remarks. Uh, you've covered a lot, uh, and I realize the time we've given you is certainly not enough. Uh, so uh, on that note, you've already begun talking about something which we have. Uh, we're hoping for uh, Professor Maitri Jagathesan to elaborate, but let me introduce Professor Jagathesan first. Uh, Professor Jagathesan is Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Santa Clara University. Uh, her research focuses on the plantation sector and tea industry and has been working there since 2008. Her award-winning book, uh, Tea and Solidarity, Tamil Women and Work in Post-War Sri Lanka, was published from University of Washington Press in 2019, and it, and it details the tea plantation gender and work relation in the context of ethno-nationalist violence and civil war in Sri Lanka. Uh, Professor Jagathesan serves on the Executive Committee of the American Institute of Sri Lankan Studies and is working on an NSF project on caste, land, and livelihood relations in Sri Lanka's northern province right now. So, uh, Professor Jagathesan, uh, if you could uh, respond to, uh, I think some of the questions have already been touched on about the kind of ways in which the ethno-nationalist politics is being recalibrated in this current moment. So, could you please speak to the question, how has the crisis revealed? and exacerbated the ruling elites project of ethno-nationalism. So, oh, well, thank you so much um, <clears throat> to Waikar and also to Jamhur for bringing us together. It's, it's an honor to actually be with um, those in the panel. It's um, to, to, you know, think of this. Um, so I want to kind of approach the question based on my research experience um, in the plantation sector and specifically with Malaya Tamil plantation residents who work on and off of the regional plantation owned um, plantation company owned estates, um, but also based on recent conversations with northern Malaya Tamils who are living and working in northern province and who migrated from the plantation areas between 1958 and 1986 in search of land and livelihood before and during the war. Um, so to answer this question, I want to start with a news item, which I've discussed in many panels before, but I think it's really important to um, think about, and it really brings together what Professor Uyangoda spoke of and also the details of thinking of um, Tiruni's comments as well. Um, and it speaks to this core of question about ethno-nationalism. On December 22, 2021, the Ministry of Plantation Industries announced it had signed an MOU with the Ministry of Industries, Mine and trade of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And the MOU settled a $251 million outstanding debt of the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation with the National Iranian Oil Company. And it outlined that Sri Lanka would send Iran 5 million US dollars worth of tea each month to repay the country for oil purchases pending from four years prior. So the MOU would stand to be, as you know, Professor Uyungoda described, one of the many kind of last efforts of the now former Rajapaksa regime to alleviate the government's insurmountable foreign debt, to conserve the last of the foreign reserves, dollars, and prevent what would soon become this, this you know, very severe economic crisis. And it would be the first time in Sri Lanka's post-independence history where tea, and a foodstuff item, an agricultural export and commodity, was used to pay back the current for country's foreign debts. And the country, def um, the government defended the agreement in the press, um, had to do so internationally as well. But the Planters Association of Ceylon, which represents the interests of the 24 regional plantation companies that are currently operating in the country, expressed their disapproval of the agreement. And I think it's important to pause on their um, statement. They said, quote, it doesn't necessarily benefit exporters as we will be paid in rupees, circumventing the free market, and it provides no real value to us. Um, and I think this really speaks to what um, Professor Uyungoda was describing um, in terms of, you know, how the capitalist classes are using and, you know, relying on the most marginalized communities, working classes to pay back these debts um, and to also think about the kind of way in which this happened. So I want to use the remaining time just to give a little bit of on the ground kind of um, 
you know, descriptions of, you know, what that working class is experiencing based on um, a recent visit of mine. Um, and just to kind of put in context in those four months as the mass protests began, um, you know, due to these um, nationwide shortages of electricity, fuel, food, medicines, and supplies, in Hatton Town where I worked, and which is kind of in this kind of central hub of the plantation areas, a healthy Malaya Tamil father of three died in um, from dehydration and exhaustion after after waiting in line for simply cooking fuel. Um, in August 2022, three Tamil Iti estate residents were swept away by floods and died on Katabula estate outside of the hill station town of Navalapitiya. And they were crossing a river to travel to the fields on which they had to work. Now, you know, just for context, Katabula Estate is located in Kotmala District. And this is something that Tiruni referred to with the Mavali um, Development Program, which Kotmala Dam had largely displaced about 11,000 families that were Malaya Tamil um, to build that dam and to provide electricity and also water to other areas, not the people who were living there. Um, you know, Kavata Plantations dominates the current price rankings of tea in the district. It won a Gold War uh, Award for specialty tea in China and holds a number of sustainability certifications. And yet when these three estate workers died, it was mutual fund organizers, uh, organizers from the community who were forced to come together to organize financial support for their families. And while ministers came to visit quite ceremoniously to the estates, all they offered Offered really were these kind of thoughts and prayers, kind of very public gestures, but um, it still remains that it was community support that had to support these families. Um, Malaya Tamil, just to context, right, Malaya Tamil plantation workers comprise one of the most socioeconomically marginalized communities in the country with respect to health indicators, educational outcomes, and income generation. Upon independence, they were disenfranchised and made stateless, and their full citizenship was not reinstated by the government until 2003, well into the Civil War. Up until 2018, the Pradesha Sabha Act did not allow the use of local resources and funds to be used on private estates for simple infrastructural repairs, such as potholes or fixing of water resource management, without the approval of the estate superintendent. So today, a majority of the community in both the plantation areas and also those who migrated and resettled and were then displaced in Northern province do not have land deeds or property rights. And yet they were situated somehow in a legal contract and moral obligation under the government to produce an agricultural commodity to repay the nation's foreign debt of 251 million US dollars. So I think for us to kind of ask who was at the decision making table to determine the value of the tea they produced and the $5 million monthly tea value, especially when they who pluck the tea and produce the tea earn incomes that are determined by a collective wage agreement contract between select trade unions and companies to receive a mere thousand rupee daily wage. And it should just, I don't have time to go into the kind of um, agreements on which the minimum wage board was brought in by the Rajapaksa government, um, the fact that this is not a living wage um, and it's still inadequate. Um, and also to note that in the months ahead of the MOU, the companies filed a writ petition in the Court of Appeals against and kind of saying they cannot pay this wage. And while that was dismissed in August of last year, I think it really speaks to what Professor Uyangoda was speaking about with the introduction of new legislation, these kind of repetitions or new forms, legal ways of repressing um, the most marginalized communities. And I think it speaks to the, the thinking about how ethno-nationalist agendas, namely ones that exclude minorities based on class, caste, location, and labor heritage operate within this free market regime to challenge what could be distributive or more restorative forms of economic justice for Malaya Hatamals. Um, as Ahil and Kadargama, um, and recently in an article, Devaka Gunawardana and Sindhuja Sridharan recently evidenced, and as you know, um, the panelists before me have said, the IMF recommendations, which adhere to the free market, really, um, they are these austerity measures um, that are introducing wage repression and also these plans to privatize state assets. And they have, in fact, widened the gap 
between Sri Lanka's elite and most wealthy and the most marginalized. Um, for Malaya Hatamal's working in the plantation sector, and also to note that many do not work in the plantation sector. They work in informal and unorganized sectors in Northern province, in Colombo and other hill station towns, and off of the plantation for smallholders, um, for largely unregulated, what is known as kaikasu or daily wage um, without EPF, ETF benefit. So, for instance, those who are domestic workers, migrant workers in the Middle East, shop and office workers, construction workers, issues of gender, caste, class and ethnic discrimination have long been overlooked by the majoritarian government's response to the crisis. And it's really up to trade unions that are not politically aligned or kind of responding to what's been, you know, this politics of patronage to the government um, to, to really advocate for their rights. Um, just to provide some ground, um, you know, evidence of this, in a recent um, visit to the states in central province just this last month, workers shared with me that their afforded wages do not give them enough income to go to the hospital to tend to even a leech bite or simple stomach ache. And if they do go to the hospital closest to their homes on the estates, the government hospital does not have any medicines and they are directed to private channeling centers to purchase their medication on the private market. And essential medicines such as those for gastritis or blood pressure that one cost that would cost 700 rupees a month now cost over 5000 rupees a month. So many are simply not taking medicine or they're pacing out their medicines for illnesses or medical conditions that they have. Essential items such as flour, rice, milk powder and eggs have more than tripled in price. And the private bus fare uh, to and from one estate that I visited that was once uh, 25 rupees in 2019 is now 84 rupees one way. And on that route, there are no government buses, which speaks to this private Shasaba Act, and there's no government buses running, so estate residents are kind of forced to rely on these privately run buses or use three wheels, which also must hike up their prices due to the fuel costs and QR codes. Um, so these price hikes, these high sites are not uniformly experienced in the plantation areas, but also in the villages in northern province, where um, the populations are majority Malaya Hatamal, and I don't have time to speak to the kind of histories of settlement that Thiruni alluded to, but also in northern province, given the resettlement schemes after the war that um, Malaya Tamils really were excluded from. Um, you know, just to give context, you know, even smaller roadside shops that are close to villages are, are in, you know, hiking up their prices because in town they'll be cheaper and so you can't get to those places um, and you must purchase the higher priced goods. So with wages not enough, you know, families are taking out private loans at high interest rates that are unregulated and if taken with informal money lenders up to more than 30% and with finance companies that are li lining the street of towns in northern province, um, really um, at 28 or 30 percent, and they're not able to pay back these loans. Um, so to conclude, I think there needs to be a public conversation about what the plantations mean, both historically and economically, to this current government and the governments before it. And in this crisis, what their stakes are in maintaining those labor hierarchies and forms of subtle and often unnamed forms of gender and caste discrimination. And to really ask the unions that are also political representatives as well, how to build forms of collector labor organizing that are untethered from this politics of patronage to the current government. Um, the tea for oil barter arrangement that I described and also the planters association predictable disapproval presents this moment that I think we can pause on <clears throat> to more broadly investigate the historical conditions of how the quote unquote freedoms of the plantation market are operating in Sri Lanka. Um, as Rajan Hul and also Kiripamala Hul demonstrate in their important book, Democracy Stillborn, the crux of the political resolution in Sri Lanka and ethno-nationalism lies at the country's founding of its democracy on fundamental rejections of Maria Hatamal's equal rights and recognition as equal citizens. And then subsequently, as Professor Uyangoda and also um, you know, um, Professor Kelagama have demonstrated, the state's subsequent upholding of the industries and other industrial investments in development, but also those profit margins at the expense of justifying low wages. Um, so for Malaya Hatamal's working and living beyond the plantations, 
that project of ethno-nationalism is doubly felt, not only because of the civil war, but also because of the state's upholding of the industry and those profit margins. And whether it's real or speculative value that's tied to those commitments, it really maintains that socioeconomic marginalization through the law, but also through the lack of distributive forms of justice, such as a living wage, land and housing rights, educational um, from, uh, affirmative action or opportunities, employment mobility, and equal access to local and national forms of governance. Um, this was all done at the expense of protecting the industry's wealth, which now we know is being used to pay back the state's debts. Um, so to conclude, as we, you know, this is the year of the 200 year marking of plantation labor in Sri Lanka. And I think that demanding this kind of justice is um, not only, you know, important, but serves as a really time where we can pause on it. <clears throat> and as one person told me that is Malaya Tamil in Northern province, they questioned this remembering last month in our conversation. And he said, what exactly do we want to remember from this plantation history and why? And what will our remembering of this history mean for pushing for more um, forms of social transformation and alternatives for economic justice for the community moving forward. Um, so I'll end here, but I, I appreciate the earlier comments and I'm looking forward to the um, comments of the other panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Maitri, for those uh, very thought-provoking uh, uh, comments and for, for us to think uh, how to move forward. And I realize 10, 15 minutes is just not enough, but thank you very much. And the conversation which just seems to be uh, sort of coming together. But now we have two more speakers. Uh, we have uh, Professor Mahendra Thiruvarangan, who is a senior lecturer in English literature, Department of Linguistic and English in University of Jaffna. He received his PhD in English from the Graduate Center, City University of New York. And his work is lies at the intersection of post-colonialism, decolonization, literature, land, and radical, radical democracy. In 2019, he served on a land commission set up by the People's Alliance for Right to Land. Uh, Professor uh, Thiruvanga, thank you so much. Uh, the question we have for you is, uh, could you please uh, tell us how Tamils and, Mus uh, and Muslims in Northern Sri Lanka have participated in the protests and how the state has responded to their participation? Uh, so thank you once again and over to you. Thank you, Shubhra, and all the organizers uh, for holding this event and inviting me to uh, share my reflections. Um, so uh, I would like to begin by giving an overview of the protest landscape of the North when the economic crisis began. So in 2009, the war came to an end, but there were people's mobilizations demanding justice for various forms of uh, injustice that people suffered during the war and before the war and after the war. So there were some key protests like, you know, the mothers of the disappeared who were fighting for the, where they were, they were trying to find out where their children are. And then there were land grabs that were happening. The military was involved in land grab, the archaeology department, the forest department. So they were all involved in land grab and communities were trying to reclaim the land that they lost to these processes. And then we also had protests demanding the release of political prisoners, and people were also demanding accountability for war crimes. And then there were also protests that were not really related to the war and the ethnic question. Women were protesting against predatory microfinance companies in the north, and there were oppressed caste communities or Panjamar communities who were protesting um, when some cremation grounds were started to refunction and these cremation grounds were located near their houses and, and people didn't want those cremation grounds to function. Um, so there were protests around those issues. And then the fishermen were protesting against um, uh, poaching by Indian trawlers. So these were some of the key protests that were happening in the North even before the economic crisis setting. So when the, when the economic crisis set in, um, uh, it, it, it created a conversation whether the Tamils in the North should protest or not. There were different positions. Some groups said like, you know, we will not protest because, uh, uh, because the nationalist groups were particularly interested in maintaining this narrative that, you know, in the North or among Northern Tamils, it's the political issues that matter a lot. And, 
like you know if we give importance to economic issues and the economic struggle that is going on uh, then like you know the international community wouldn't take notice of the political struggle and 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 the demands that were associated with the political struggle so there was there was a group that was actively even discouraging protests so if we, you know even within our university teachers association when we had this conversation some people really wanted us to remain silent because this silence is going to be helpful to the tamils and the international community was going to do something but there were other groups which wanted to have these protests and oh at least they wanted a conversation about you know the economic crisis and how this economic crisis was linked to the war and the ethnic question and how as tiruni mentioned like you know how development and ethnicity were so strongly related and uh, so that that was another group that thought like you know this conversation was necessary so there were groups that protested too right there was uh, the university teachers association the fisheries uh, 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 associations in jatna and then uh, the new marxist uh, the new democratic marxist leninist party and then there was also a tna led group they all protested these were very small scale protests but what was interesting was that these protests in a way combined some of the long standing demands of the tamils with these new demands related to the economic crisis so people came up with demands like you know abolishing executive presidency wealth tax then a redistributed economy redistribution of land so these were some of the key demands but at the same time people also called for a federal solution justice for the disappeared justice for war crimes um, um so so these these demands were different i think in the north um but there were others who remained who didn't want to protest but they were also asking important questions and these questions were directed not just to the state but also the protesters in the south so like you know there was a there was an economic crisis in the north during the war there was an economic embargo there were there was no gas no electricity for a long period of time so people went through this situation in the north earlier but somehow trade unions and other activists and student groups they didn't raise these issues right they didn't see these issues as their problems or they didn't want to uh, extend solidarity to the tamils who were suffering because of the economic embargo and people also asked questions related to how like you know the malaya tamil community was treated badly ever since independence and how they were exploited economically people also spoke about how you know in conflict affected regions like nayaru i think which is very close to very oya in the mulatibu district where there is a conflict between local fishermen who are predominantly tamil and then singalese fishermen who would come as migrant fishermen and then they were backed by the state and so so the state was in a way like denying the rights of the local fishermen so there was an economic problem but then that was also that also had an ethnic dimension so like you know did the southern protesters really raise these issues did they really talk about how ethnicity and development and economy were intertwined right so these questions were raised in a productive manner i thought even even by those who didn't really participate in the struggle so in some of the protests um, the muslim community in the north also joined uh, and before that also before the during the covid crisis there was a protest in jaffna uh, that was mainly organized to uh, condemn the forcible cremation of those who muslims who died of covid 19 so um so the, so there was participation uh, uh, by muslims in some of the protests organized around the economic crisis later on uh, as far as the state's response is concerned you know whenever there is a protest in jaffna you would see um, uh, you know people who are close to the military or affiliated with the military or the military intelligence wing who would come with cameras and record these protests and this is something that we would see often when we have protests at the university so when tamil students commemorate um, uh, uh, the ltt cadres or when they commemorate the those who died during the war so this surveillance was there so when the when when we had protests outside the university during the economic crisis again the same people came with their cameras but i think you know this was a country wide protest so um 
so they didn't like you know they were not really worried that the that northerners are also protesting because i think at the time everybody's attention was on the south because you know in terms of number uh, the southern protest or the protest at golpes was very huge compared to the protest that we had in the north and there were also differences in the way people in the north protested for instance like you know uh, when we organized our protest, we didn't carry the national flag or people didn't sing the national anthem. So people didn't talk about a common Sri Lankan identity as such. Uh, but you know, on the whole, what I would say is that this was a productive moment in many ways because people are this, this allowed Northern Tamils and Northern Muslims to bring to the fore certain questions that have been ignored in the Southern protest movement. So, um, and, and then later on, if you see like, you know, some of the conversations are still continuing, for instance, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, there is a campaign in the South against this uh, uh, act and Northern Tamil politicians have also taken a lead role in this campaign. And then there are students from the South who are now coming to Jaffna and talking to activists and student groups in the North about the PTA and, and these conversations are sometimes they have been difficult. Sometimes, you know, uh, people get angry, people question the student leaders from the South, like, you know, what did you do when students in the North were arrested and detained under Prevention of Terrorism Act and when people went through immense suffering during the war. So I think when, when these questions are raised, when the Southern activists and leaders are questioned, I think, they also now seem to understand that there are certain things that they they have to do to, you know, start a conversation with those who suffer during the war in the north. And 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 there is that opening that is happening. But I think more work has to be done, and there should be more conversations about these issues. But I, the last point that I would like to make is, you know, the north is also not homogeneous. It's not just Tamil because the Muslims who were evicted by the LTT in 1990 are returning to the North or have returned, many of them have returned, some others are still returning and they face landlessness, they face livelihood issues. And as Maitri said, we also have a Malayha Tamil population in certain parts of the North and they have land and livelihood issues. And then the Panjamar communities or the oppressed caste communities who have been landless for centuries and, and, and this economic crisis has you know, hit these communities really adversely. Uh, so, uh, so when we talk about you know the the economic crisis and and how it has animated the north, yes, there is always you know a very dominant ethnic character to everything that happens in the north, and 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 it is always understood through an ethnic lens. But I think there are also other lenses through which we have to understand it through caste and class and, and the experiences of the Malay Earth Tamil communities and, and the returning Muslims. So, so I think conversations have to happen in those directions to understand how the crisis has affected and how community and, and the need for the communities to come together and build alliances towards you know broadening the question of justice, right? It's not just justice for like you know the war crimes but also economic justice that is needed in the north too right so on that note i would like to end my remarks thank you thank you so much mahindran for your comments uh, thought provoking and something for us to mobilize around uh, our last uh, speaker for the, the panel is uh, uh, swastika arulingam uh, i have a very brief bio for her uh, and perhaps you, you may want to add uh, uh, she's currently she's attorney at law and is the president of the Commercial and Indust Industrial Workers Union in Sri Lanka. Uh, Swastika, we have a couple of questions for you and you may choose to answer the way you, whichever way you want. So we, some things, some of the issues have been addressed a bit, but if you could elaborate on if on how the protests were different from other protests that have happened in the past and something to which Mahindran was referring to what are the role of community organizations in bringing people together in this uh, moment of crisis. So to you. Uh, Shubhra, and thank you for inviting me to speak uh, today. And um, I also want to, I was quite, uh, it was quite heartening to hear Tiru Mahindran, who, uh, who lives in the North, I mean, who lives in Jaffna, uh, and uh, for him to say that there is, there are many positive things which came out of this uh, protest which happened uh, last year 
and the culmination of that was July 9th, which has never been never seen before in the history of Sri Lanka. And it's important to hear that because uh, since the end of the protest, because it was crushed with the military presence on the ground, uh, several criticisms have come up on the way the protest was done, who was behind the protest, was there international um, actors backing it, and so many criticisms which were coming our way. Uh, so maybe what I will do is I will just give you a sense of what was happening last year on the ground because I was there and then also uh, speak a little bit about, about the aftermath of the protest and what we felt um, which were some of the achievements and some of the criticisms of the protest. So I think uh, to put it very simply, uh, there was a lot of resentment which was growing because of the economic policies. It was a long time coming, but uh, at least in the capital city, Colombo, uh, there was a lot of resentment because uh, life as we know it had come to a standstill. Uh, there were fuel queues, there was uh, gas distribution has stopped. So uh, there was a lot of resentment. Uh, uh, there were electricity, there were power cuts, long power cuts. And I think this resentment kind of uh, slowly started trickling onto the streets where you found urban middle-class uh, families coming onto the streets and having these roadside protests. And people like me, for instance, we were quite uh, skeptical about these roadside protests because we have seen this uh, happening in the past and it never, you know, it never takes off anywhere. It stops one or two days after it stops. But I think because the crisis was so deep and so, um, so strong and so uh, prevalent, um, these roadside protests continued. And I think at some point, people started converging, different, different cities started uh, converging, even uh, different, different locations started converging. And there was a moment in uh, March, towards the end of March, 2022, where a, a group of protesters were protesting in front of the uh, president's uh, residence were attacked by the uh, special task force uh, of the police. And that became a violent uh, rupture uh, in the whole scene of uh, neighborhood protests and this peaceful protest which was going on, going on until that point. And uh, lawyers started getting uh, involved uh, in the protest movement and unprecedentedly 400 lawyers appeared for, uh, pro bono appeared for these protesters showing their sign of solidarity also uh, towards this protest moment. So that, that moment where uh, the peaceful protest kind of erupted into violence due to the uh, inter intervention of the uh, state uh, law enforcement authority kind of spilled over uh, into a location called the golf face, which is, uh, which I would argue is one of the most prime properties uh, uh, in the city of Colombo. And this very ordinary people without political or without economic power simply went into this golf face stretch and occupied this place quite successfully uh, for uh, three, four months. And that, that is the start of this uh, protest movement. And of course, once this, this group of middle-class people started occupying this call face movement, I think the establishment at that time also underestimated uh, what this protest movement can do in terms of resistance. But once um, traditional groups such as student groups, trade unions, uh, left political parties who, who are more known to come out to the streets in protest when they saw this, they also got on board uh, and started supporting this protest movement. And I think that is how uh, it kind of um, uh, obtained mass support and uh, the numbers came in uh, through the support of these uh, traditional groups which have, engaged, which have been engaged or used to be engaged in uh, uh, street resistance. So a uh, few reflections on this golf phase occupation is that one of the most uh, telling things for me is the, the fact that the Rajapaksas over a period of 10 years one of their prime projects was to, um, to, to urbanize or to build the city and push the urban poor out of the city or into the margins of the, of the city. So their entire thing was about beautifying uh, the cities, Colombo city and so on. So it, 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 is in, it is on that kind of political terrain that this ordinary group of people came and occupied one of the most prime properties in Colombo. And that was a a moment of uh, class, almost like a class victory, even though it lasted only for a few months. And the other thing, of course, is the establishment, the Rajapaksas completely underestimated the anger, the simmering uh, tensions with, within the entire, uh, uh, within different sections of populations in Sri Lanka because of the economic crisis. And the fact that this call phase protest, also known as the Aragalia, managed to contain this anger in a, in a peaceful, uh, sense of resistance or a peaceful protest. So they would say this is a peaceful Aragalia. These, uh, this, we, the, the people prided in calling it a, a peaceful struggle. So I think the Rajapaksas completely underestimated the, 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 
how these protests contain the anger which existed uh, in the larger society. So when the prime minister at that time in 2022, Mahindra Rajapaksa was forced to resign, he decided to unleash violence on the golfers protesters. And the moment he brought in um, a group of uh, armed men and started attacking these peaceful protests, almost all the suburbs and the neighboring cities of Colombo burst, uh, burst out into violence. And there were violent attacks on parliamentarian houses. There was, uh, there was, uh, there was a lot of violence and uh, politicians were under attack. So I think the establishment also underestimated how much of the anger this call face space also contained uh, in terms of, uh, yes, we want a regime change, but we want it uh, done peacefully. And of course, the July 9th moment, anyone who was on the ground, it was, uh, it was just unimaginable. Um, it was a, a pure moment where people came together from all classes and said, we want this president to go home. Of course, we were not expecting uh, another person who has been in politics for 46 years to come in his place, but that is what people wanted. And I think in a sense that that goal was achieved uh, through the people's uh, movement. But what was, because it was such an, un, um, it was un, such an unbelievable moment, even people inside Sri Lanka would raise questions and doubts as to the motives of the protesters, whether we were funded by international actors or whether some state was behind this and so on. How I would see it is that the protest itself was not it was a pure moment where people came together because the crisis was so deep. So there's nothing preventing, people had nothing to lose other than to come and fight. But the, the suppression which happened afterwards, the coming into power of Ranil Vikramasinghe and the fact that he had successfully stayed on in power despite the uh, continuing crisis and the fact that he has managed to um, create this sense of normalcy, at least within certain sections of the middle-class population, that I would say has been backed by um, uh, different states who have a particular interest in keeping Ranil Vikramasinghe in power, particularly when this IMF uh, deal is coming on. So I would say the fall of the Aragalia was definitely backed up by um, different states coming and backing up and saying, no, no, now enough of your protests. We want a peaceful Sri Lanka so that we can drive through our development agenda, what we think should be uh, development inside Sri Lanka. And the previous speakers also spoke about uh, race relations and they also spoke about, I think Tiruni spoke about the, the concept of development in Sri Lanka. And what we are seeing right now is uh, a president who is uh, completely, who, do, who does not have the popular mandate of the people who came into uh, being the president because of a parliamentary vote. And his only support base, I would say, is the uh, party, the Rajapaksa's party, the Sri Lanka Pudujana Paramuna. And he has surrounded himself uh, with uh, with the military. So he is crushing any kind of dissent which is rising on the ground. Yesterday there was a there was a protest by uh, the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation workers and uh, the leaders who were uh, who was uh, who was organizing this protest was interdicted or was sent home. So he is showing absolutely no restraint on on crushing uh, protesters on the ground. Since the end of the Aragalia there has been two people who have died uh, due to tear gassing uh, by the state. Uh, as, uh, some, as someone mentioned, the government is passing something called the Anti-Terror Act right now, which is like the new face of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, which makes even a simple protest or simple, simply holding a board against the government an act of terrorism. So we are watching these things. And of course, um, since Ranil Vikramasinghe has come to power, um, what we have seen is, um, uh, is a no tolerance policy towards any kind of resistance which is coming on the ground. But what is interesting also is that people are not just sitting and waiting because the crisis uh, is very deep. And how I would describe it if, is if, if you go to the, uh, let's say if you go to the plantation or if you go to the uh, free trade zones um, where uh, the, the export, export industry, where the export sector industry is based, uh, uh, wages have stagnated there. People are paid around 30,000 rupees per month. The cost of living has gone up. So people are no longer eating. So there's a lot of resentment growing uh, on the ground. And, uh, and what, what is concerning for many of us who, who are watching this process, who are also part of trade unions and so on, is that last year, the protest movement was peaceful. So it managed to contain the anger and the discontent uh, through this peaceful resistance. But since this peaceful resistance has been broken, now we fear, particularly people uh, in Colombo, we fear that the next resistance which is going to come might not be peaceful, particularly because the government is using the armed forces without any restraint. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swastika, for those comments and some uh, real reasons to 
worry about the way things are going on and how dissent is being criminalized and how these acts of terrorism are being passed and what is to come is actually more worrisome. Um, perhaps we can open the floor and ask any of the, uh, from the audience, we can take a few questions. Given the constraint of time, uh, please, I will request you to keep your comments very, very brief. And if it's targeted, uh, if it's presented to the panel, please mention that. Or if it's to one of the speakers, please do mention. Could you please raise your hands and or in, using the reaction uh, box at the bottom? That'll be greatly appreciated. Any questions? Yes. Uh, John Rogers, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm John Rogers from the American Institute for Sri Lankan Studies. Uh, you know, one thing that was striking about the series of very uh, stimulating comments is that nobody mentioned the formal opposition, the primary opposition, the NPP or the SJB. So I wonder if uh, one or more of the panelists might want to comment briefly on that, that might show perhaps a, a deeper malaise in the political class that nobody thought of even mentioning them. If I may briefly comment on uh, John's comment, see the NPP, the JVP, and even the Frontline Socialist Party have been trying to establish links with uh, the the Tamil, uh, you know, people, working people, and uh, progressive political groups in the plantation areas as well as, as, well as in the north. But uh, there's a problem as far as both Frontline Socialist Party and the JVP. Actually, Frontline Socialist Party is a more radical breakaway group from uh, the JVP. They are a little very, you know, ambiguous about uh, the political rights of the uh, Tamil people and Muslim people. They don't want to support even the 13th Amendment openly. You see, they would say that under their, when they come into power, the problems of the Tamil people would be solved by them. That's, they don't go beyond that. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, I think the challenge that even student leaders who have been visiting Jaffna to meet people in Jaffna, as Tiro said, you know, they will have to confront that problem. And I hope that that conversation that they have started with student activists in Jaffna would compel them to rethink their silence on the ethnic question and minority rights. And SJB, there's Samadhi Jana Balwege, I think John asked about SJB as well that the other leading political opposition party, I think they have links with the plantation Tamil people, but they're very formal political party, election alliances based links, not organic political links with the plantation, uh, you know, people, Malhavi Tamil people. I'm sorry, I'm using this old word, plantation is not, you know, the politically correct term, you know, Malhavi Tamil people. And SJB doesn't have those organic links. I don't think the JVP or the FSP have organic links with the Malay Tamil people either. So that's my response to your comment, John. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? If not, I would uh, invite uh, Ranjit K first to introduce yourself and um, let us know if the questions for the panel or, or some. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm Ranjit. I'm joining from uh, Toronto, um, student at York University. Um, my question is, what has or has it, if at all, the Sinhalese Buddhist consciousness changed during this Aragal era and within this period of, of one year? Um, because it's the same, Sinhalese Buddhist community who uh, overwhelmingly put the Rajapaksha regime to power to the extent that Gotabaya Rajapaksha was uh, 
portrayed as some of one of those mythical king coming to save the paradise on earth. Now that, that was the level of Sinhalese Buddhist vicious nationalism existed in uh, or exists in Canada, in, in, in sorry, Sri Lanka. And has Aragalia changed that public consciousness or has it uh, through the Aragalia, has it become more insidious and subtle? I don't think it has, uh, Aragali has really challenged uh, the Sinhala Buddhist uh, conscience as you, as, as you uh, framed it. Because uh, this, this Aragali was very limited to uh, the economic crisis and almost a spontaneous uh, uprising or uh, dealing with the tensions which existed uh, at the time continues to exist in society also. So very recently when I was having a conversation with a group of um, uh, Sinhalese who um, who engaged very actively in the Aragalia. They said, you know, we don't understand why the Northern people are not joining us. We even went visited Jaffna and we were speaking to them, but you know, they were very reluctant to uh, engage with us. And the response to that, which was given by a group of uh, people from Jaffna is that they said, you know, we would also like to join the Aragalia, but when we do join the government will put us under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. And when they put us under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, would you come and support uh, support us and uh, tell the government not to do this. So he very simply put it and he said, you know, we have uh, walked over dead bodies, uh, we have faced the war, uh, so many people have died and none of you spoke about it at that time. So are you ready to have these conversations now? So I don't think it has uh, altered uh, the Sinhala Buddhist uh, consciousness or this idea of um, that they have actually consciously or the Sinhalese population as a whole um, through an inherent sense of uh, race superiority has done something wrong to the Tamil people because I don't think there was space enough to have that conversation. But I think because of these questions which are arising, why aren't the Northern people or the Eastern people and the Malaya people, why aren't they joining our struggle? Because of the questions they're asking, they're also able to hear uh, the answers which are coming from uh, the minorities. I also want to uh, maybe uh, add a little bit more to what uh, Professor Yangoda said about the NPP and the SJB. Apart from their um, issues or the, the fact that they are unable to confront the whole uh, uh, ethnic question or the national question, they, we also don't have an opposition uh, in the country. Now, for instance, the NPP has a, uh, it, it is, uh, it is the, the basis of the NPP is a party called the Janata Vimukti Paramuna, which is a left party in Sri Lanka. But it has, it has almost morphed into something called the NPP. And if you look at the policies and principles of the NPP, it is no longer left. I mean, they would support the IMF, they would support privatization, uh, they are silent when uh, unions are crushed. So NPP is no longer, I would not consider NPP to be uh, any, any more uh, a left uh, party or a party with a left kind of um, ideology or sense. And the SJB, is a breakaway faction from a traditional uh, political party, the United National Party, from which Ranil Vikramasinghe comes from. The SJB, to me at least, it sounds like a group of people strung, strung together. Uh, there is no leadership as such. Everyone comes and tells their opinion on a matter. So you can't hold the party to one opinion. So some have a uh, bit towards um, a socialist idea or social democratic idea. Some people have extreme capitalist ideas. Some are uh, racist. Some are, you know, we need to build uh, bridges between the minorities. So there is no sense of opposition uh, mm -hmm. inside the parliament. And that is one of the reasons why, particularly because Ranil Vikram Singh has been able to successfully push through very repressive legislation, including a legislation like the Bureau of Rehabilitation, which is essentially uh, the creation of uh, a camps under the guise of rehabilitation where anyone who dissenting against the government will now be able to, now the, the, the government will be able to herd them into places called rehabilitation centers and essentially extract forced labor, uh, torture, and so on and so forth. And now that is legal now. So one of the reasons why the parliament or Ranil Vikram Singh has been able to push through all of his repressive policies is because we don't have an opposition in parliament. And even if they don't have the numbers in parliament, at least they're not building opposition on the ground. So that is the sad reality in Sri Lanka in terms of the political terrain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, May I? yes, uh, Paul. could you please uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Ratnajeevan Hool, uh, calling from Trinkamali, 
in the northeast of sri lanka i live in jaffna but i am now speaking from trincomalee we are not able to hear yeah. you clearly uh, i was mm-hmm. sorry maybe my internet uh, is poor <laughs> i'm I using a hotspot so. i think yeah. so is it possible for you to type the question for us on the chat box that's my comment uh so i don't know maybe <laughs> i mean professor yangode is one of the more liberal singalis uh, he may support both but uh, the vast majority do not support either and so making common cause is a very tough proposition for us normally i would have joined the aragaliya but these have prevented me from doing that <laughs> so you call me a liberal signalist i don't uh, i hope it's not a backhanded compliment <laughs> no no i meant it as a compliment full compliment <laughs> <laughs> well uh, you see i can uh, link my response to uh, the the question asked by ranjit as well you know i don't think aragale change uh, the singhala nation buddhist nationalist ideology as such but it's very important for us not to ignore the fact that aragale marked ideological crisis of the rajapaksha project right that is very important you know the rajapaksha's ideological hegemony has been in crisis and the aragale represented that crisis that is why you know there were no single nationalist slogans emerging from within aragale right uh, but even uh, you know i have and i have i have been there i have and i think uh, swatika can tell us she was there more than i did in terms of time spending there but no single slogan of single and nationalism they are raised by any group that can be described as a, you know sub, you know as subscribe into the rajapaksha project you see rajapaksha project in politically and ideologically has been in deep crisis and anagale was the moment of you know you know that crisis being expressed by the people so so i think we have to make a subtle distinction between what aragale has done and what aragale actually marked and represented politically so uh, that's a Uh, my response to you know dr jeevan pools comment as well uh, because uh, singhala nationalism rajapaksha version is no longer politically significant in sri lanka and i think ranil vikram singh also trying to you know make use of that break for his political advantage at the moment thank you thank you so much for this uh, really thought provoking and engaging comments there are a few and quite a few on the uh, chat box as well um i think i if there is no further pressing conversations and i completely agree this was uh given the complexity of the crisis and the situation and what it means for just not for sri, sri lanka for those of us who are observing it from outside uh this is uh just not enough time this is just the beginning of the conversation i hope we can continue the conversation i'm truly grateful for your time for your engagement for your comments and for those who are presenting of course and for those of you who are participating in discussion as well so thank you very much and um thank you and look forward to a further conversation another time thank you <laughs>